Does the council have to help me if I'm not in priority need? Now, with a lot of these questions, the answer is yes, but, and there's quite a big but with this one. So I'm going to try and explain what situations the council would have to help, which is a lot of them actually, but actually what that help entails, because the key thing is it won't necessarily, or it often won't, actually involve an offer of accommodation. It might involve some sort of help or some sort of work around that. So let's go back to basics. Anyone can approach any local authority in England and ask them for housing assistance. It comes under part seven of the Housing Act. And if we actually quickly look at section 184 of the Housing Act it might just help us kind of grasp what's going on here so I'm not going to read it all out but what it essentially says is if the local authority has reason to believe that the applicant and an applicant is simply someone who's asked the council for help with housing may be homeless or may be threatened with homelessness then the council then has a number of duties that then follow on from it. If we look at 18.5 of the Code of Guidance, it basically says that homeless applications can be made to any department of the local housing authority and be expressed in any particular form. So you'll notice straight away that priority need is not mentioned at all within those that initial kind of gateway into the assistance that's owed to you. And if you ever want to know what gatekeeping is, gatekeeping is simply when the council blocks that gateway into the assistance. So section 184 is easily the most important section of part 7 of the Housing Act and equally I'd say that 18.5 of the Code of Guidance is the most important paragraph of the whole Code of Guidance because it, as I say it's its entry point into everything else and, and a lot of councils the way they kind of prevent people getting into TA is they simply don't engage with those initial duties. So as I say priority is not mentioned yet. It does come in very quickly though because once you've made an application if there is reason to believe that you might be homeless, might be eligible for assistance and might have a priority need, they have to provide interim accommodation up until the point when they're satisfied you're not in priority need or you're not homeless or you're not eligible. So that's kind of how it works. So let's say for example someone makes a, an application to a local housing authority and there is no reason at all to think they might be in priority need. So let's say someone who's healthy and robust to use the wording of case law on vulnerability approaches a council makes a homeless application and let's just say just for the sake of argument that they're a British national who've lived there all their life. They can make an application as I say, priority needs, local connection and intentional homelessness are not mentioned at all in that initial duty. Um, but there's no reason to think that they might be in priority needs, so they're not offered interim accommodation. The council's next job is to essentially take, carry out some inquiries and establish whether they are satisfied that the applicant is homeless and is eligible for assistance. And if the answer to those two questions is yes, and that might take a few days to figure out sometimes, the relief duty then starts. And if you're not in priority need, there is still quite a lot of stuff that could happen that might be helpful. So um, before or, or simultaneous to the relief duty starting, the council have to carry out an assessment to work out why it is you became homeless, what type of accommodation you need and what support you might need to maintain it. And they also come up with this personalised housing plan. It's supposed to be a collaboration, you're supposed to do it with them. But what often happens is you meet with them and then they'll send a template PHP through which kind of just goes through all the basics that, that everyone applies to everyone. And there's no personalisation whatsoever, so that's a, a different issue. But that should be helpful in itself, so that should cover things like how much LHA you're entitled to, for example, and it should actually go into the detail of, you know, are you exempt from the LHA shared accommodation rate, that sort of thing. But it won't always, again, it will kind of often be, be pretty shallow, to be honest, but as I say, we're kind of, I guess, trying to talk about what the council should do rather than what they actually do. At that point... The council doesn't actually have to do anything meaningful within the relief period. So the relief duty period lasts for 56 days. They don't have to do anything. They can kind of make it look like they're doing stuff but not actually do anything. And if you're not in priority need, when that relief duty ends, that's the end of the help that's going to be owed to you. Now, a lawyer might argue that technically they should consider extending the relief period for longer, but I don't think that really happens. And it's probably not something that a lawyer really wants to get involved in because there's not a kind of a, a particularly good chance of it actually being useful for you if you were to even to win the case and get an extension. So the council doesn't have to do anything uh, if you're not in priority need. There's no motivation. I think it's, I guess, important to understand what the motivation of councils will be because they don't have enough housing to kind of discharge their actual housing duties into. And when I say housing duties, I mean the duty to put a roof over your head. If you're not in priority need, there is no duty to put a roof over your head. So councils have this kind of, you know, very limited amount of housing which they will try and their best to use to, to, to people who owe a housing duty. So if you're not in priority need, there is not a lot of motivation for councils to actually help you into accommodation because they would reserve it for people that they actually owe a duty to. Now, they could use rogue landlords and kind of, well, dodgy landlords, let's say, where, whereas they couldn't use that for someone who's in priority need. So there's kind of a higher standard. If you're in priority need, there's a slightly higher standard of what type of accommodation would be suitable for you. But you know, councils will work with rogue landlords or dodgy landlords or whatever. And 
as I say, one of the things they can also do is they can basically help you into accommodation which is likely to be available for at least six months. That would also be a discharge of the relief duty. And if you turn it down, the relief duty probably will end and there'll be no further duty owed to you. And that could be, you know, that there is a chance that that could actually be half decent because councils, a lot of councils will have relationship with the local private uh, rented sector. You know, landlords will come to the council and say, look, I've got a property, it's vacant, can you fill it with someone? And, you know, in some circumstances, the council will be like, hell yeah, we want to, as long as, as I say, they're not, you know, kind of, it's not really ropey. And so the, the council would, at that point, be incentivised to, to effectively put you into that property. And you might think that contradicts what I've just said previously, but what actually can happen sometimes is that um, when a landlord comes to a council, the council knows that if they put someone who's not going to be likely to be a good tenant into that property, it's going to fail, and then the landlord you know, kind of gets an order of the council and it breaks that relationship down. So at that point, the council are motivated to put good tenants into those kind of tenancies or people who look like they're going to be good tenants and that's going to often come down to their housing history why they lost their last accommodation are they working that sort of thing so there would be some times when the council would be motivated to put you forward for a private rented property and that's kind of almost outside the kind of the duties they have to house you that's just kind of part of the assistance they can can give you and equally if you were to go and find private rented accommodation in your area which is halfway as affordable then the council again will be motivated to help you into that property. So that might be by paying your deposit. It might be guaranteeing the or guaranteeing the deposit. It might be paying the first month's rent or housing other other costs. Because again, at that point, it doesn't cost the council anything in terms of the properties they've got available. So councils quite often have a bit more money than they do properties. So if if, if a thousand pounds is going to be enough to get you first month's rent and, and into that property, then they'll probably pay it because it's in their interest. Because first of all, they can record it as a positive stat. They can report back to central government and say, hey, we prevented someone being homeless or we relieved someone being homeless. Um, but it might also kind of lead to a relationship with that private landlord, which might result in the council getting offered more properties if it goes well. So you've got no control over how that really kind of ends up happening, but it can happen. I've certainly worked with people who they weren't in priority need. They sort of wandered into a council, made an application. It just so happened that second that a landlord had offered a property, and that person effectively became the most kind of you know the most likely good tenant and then you know kind of they worked to, to kind of make all that work out but it's it's unlikely but it's possible and equally count some councils at least will have so-called hard to let properties which is code for absolute shitholes in t often kind of tower blocks affected by lots of antisocial behavior but it is technically social housing so they might also make what's called a final part six offer to that person it, it's unlikely but it's possible and you know you'd have to consider the you know you don't have to be in priority need to get that offer so you know you'd have to consider it and again if you turned it down that's the end of the process there is no other help the council will likely give you so those are things that can happen but if you're not in priority need there's no kind of massive motivation for a council to act you know as i say they don't even house the people who are in priority need and you know they have a duty to actually house so they're unlikely to house people that they don't have a duty to house that's kind of how it works but as i say behind the scenes there's actually quite a lot happening that you, you just don't you're just not aware of you know you won't you, you won't really kind of understand what's going on but that could lead to other offers being made so it's always worth making a homeless application you know if you want to get you know any help the council should be your go-to place you know it should be someone where you get competent advice and assistance if nothing else under section 179 of the housing at 1996 there is a duty to provide advice and i'm pretty sure that kind of would constitute legal advice so it has to be competent it has to be actually you know something that you can then rely on and kind of make decisions about and the personalized housing plan in itself might throw up some really useful information that will kind of help you make the diff you know, help make the difference in your situation the other thing councils can do is they can refer you to supported accommodation or they can re signpost you to supported accommodation Again, it's you know that supported accommodation, so a lot of people would rather not be there, but um, it's better than nothing. An offer is better than nothing, I guess. All kind of information is going to be better than no information, so that can also happen. Um, but I guess the final thing I'd say is that in my experience, the vast majority of people that certainly that I would come across within my casework will actually be in priority need. They might have been told that they're not in priority need, either just verbally, which doesn't you know kind of matter at all really. It has to be in writing. But even when priority need decisions are made in writing, when the negative ones are made, they're often just nonsense. They're just templates. The housing officer just kind of puts some nonsense in. As a you know, if you look at what the definition of vulnerability is uh, and therefore priority need. It's basically looking at, you know, does a person have an impairment which is going to make it more difficult for that person to, to first of all find housing and then deal with the lack of it? And so the majority of people who become homeless, you know, they find housing again. You know, they're working, they've got money, they've got support network. They will be able to source their own accommodation 
if someone has to come and resort to a day centre or some sort of homeless service, that would already be evidence. It's not kind of um, you know kind of uh, smoking gun evidence yet, but it's certainly be evidence that, that that person might have vulnerabilities, which mean they have not been able to source accommodation themselves. So you know, and then you look at the kind of the correlation between health issues of various kinds, disabilities, that sort of thing, abuse, trauma, that sort of thing, and homelessness. All of those things are going to be relevant to priority need. But you might need a lawyer or you might need a decent advocate to actually help you make that argument. Because as I say, housing officers, it's really easy for them to gatekeep people and, 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 and tell people who are, not, who are vulnerable that they're not vulnerable because they're, they're the easiest people to actually to do that to. They're the people who are least able to actually fight a council and kind of take them to task. So if you look at the kind of, the kind of perverse non-priority decisions you get, they're almost always going to be about vulnerability. And as I say, the more vulnerable you are, the easier it is to do. So that's why you need a decent advocate, if you can get one, to actually put forward the best argument to the council and show that you're actually in priority need. If you're a decent advocate and you've kind of got a track record with a council, it actually becomes quite easy to do, as in win the cases. And if you're a solicitor, then it's even easier because the threshold of providing interim accommodation is low. And actually, the threshold of vulnerability, you know, in, in kind of in general is not actually that high. You know, you just need to have something which makes you significantly or, or significantly differentiates you from a healthy and robust person, again, to use that wording which would lead to kind of a risk of harm that they would not be suffering. So if you've got a pre-existing medical condition, which is likely to be made significantly worse by being homeless, you're already there really, that's that's kind of the definition. Again, we've done some other videos about that. Um, so, so the other thing to say is that if you make a homeless application and that you're told you're not in priority need, you should challenge it, you know, it's, councils just make these perverse non-priority decisions because they know most people don't challenge them and you just need to keep those challenges nice and short. In that section 184 letter which says you're not in priority need, it will say at the end of it, if you don't agree with this decision you can ask for a review, a review of it within 21 days of receiving the letter um, and that kind of gives you a bit of time just to kind of potentially get more medical evidence or just make sure that the council has actually considered the medical evidence that you already provided properly which is often the problem. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, there's always it's always worthwhile making a homeless application. Um, but I guess in summary, to say if you're not in priority need, it does massively reduce the chances of you of you being housed through the council. But it's not going to do any harm. That's the important thing to say. It's not other than the fact that the way you're treated by the by the housing officer and the stress that causes. Objectively speaking, if that's the right word, you're not going to be any worse off by making a homeless application. It's only going to increase your options. It's not going to reduce them. Um, so yeah, so. As I say, um, the, the one caveat with that that I can think of, and there might be a couple of others, is if you make a homeless ap application and you're found intentionally homeless, that can then have a potentially negative impact on your housing register application in some councils, not every council, because they have a different policy around the country. So there are some very kind of obscure situations where you're worse off by making an application. Another one, just to kind of explain it, I guess, as well, is where you're already on the housing register, you've already got a pretty good banding, you've already got a realistic prospect of uh, getting housing that way, and by making the homeless application, the policy in effect penalises you for it, so it might drop you down a banding, or it might reset your registration date or something like that. So it does get quite complicated, there's no kind of one size fits all bit of information I can give you to work that out for yourself. Uh, but some councils policies are really good anyway and they'll generally prioritize people who are homeless over people who are not homeless but as i say there are some notable exceptions to that so yeah as always put questions in the chat if any of that didn't make sense or if it did make sense you want to know more um if you haven't checked out the live stream on a thursday night do so 7 30 it's recorded so you don't have to watch it live but we'll just kind of discuss these kind of questions in a bit more detail and a bit more informally um, just to kind of get this information out there and if you got this far if you want to get notifications about new videos do subscribe to the channel do give it a like because hopefully it will help other people out as well just by getting it out of there 